Welcome to a Wednesday edition of Unexpected Points. I am joined by a very special guest to discuss the new overtime playoff rules in the NFL. Also go into a little bit of his history. I will reveal who that is after the intro music. Thanks so much, everyone. This is Unexpected Points. All righty, righty, righty. Thank you, everyone, for joining me. We have a guest here. You don't have to hear me drone on for an hour. Uh, my guest today, my esteemed guest, my very, very well-placed guest, I would say, for this type of episode is Sam Schwartzstein. Sam is the former, I have his exact title here for the, what is it, the XFL, Director of Operations, Innovations, and Strategy at the XFL. He also gave a very enlightening talk at the 2022 recent Sloan MIT conference on reimagining football, first data-driven football league. So, Sam, thank you for joining me. Excited to be here. Um, this will be a little bit different than the hotel lobby um, at the Sheridan where we uh, met, finally met in person, went from internet friends to in-person friends at, in yes, Boston. Yes, yes. Yeah, that was a successful transition. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it's it, it doesn't go so well. Um, but yeah, we had we had some fun. There were some stories there that we don't need to get into about uh, locations we ended up eventually in that night. But yeah, I'm glad that we could reconnect here because number one, we've had some conversations about how we could do some more work together and collaborate in the future, and, and we'll think about that some more. Number two, with the NFL rule change, a big rule change, at least a big talked about rule change. Only in overtime, though, so we'll see what it is. Uh, changing the overtime rules here. I want to go through that with you because you've thought about these things in painstaking detail when it comes to how to think about changing the game, using data also in informing those choices and testing and so on. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some of that stuff in a second. Uh, before we get into really all this stuff, I just want to quickly let everyone know uh, for 25% off a PFF subscription, unexpected points is the promo code here. Uh, promo code unexpected. You can get all of that now that I believe our 30% off for free agency has gone away. So go ahead and use that to get 25% off any PFF subscription. So, okay, so, Sam, let's get into this a little bit here. Before we start, I would say that I was I was doing some research on you and Wikipedia page, a well-filled out Wikipedia page. I, I have, we have to ask you straight up. How much of that Wikipedia page did you did you personally fill out? I I did not fill out a single piece of that Wikipedia page. That was put together <laughs> through my draft profile. I promise. A lot of people have accused me of making my own Wikipedia page. If you know about that, you cannot do certain things based on IP address, and they'll figure out who you who's doing it. But in the football community, there are some fervent Schwartzstein fans. Let's put it like that. And I expect that that's the kind of people that put together that that Wikipedia page. Oh yeah, I, I can imagine. There's a there's a whole. Yeah, you need like a name for for the Schwartz fans. This the 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 Schwartz tribe, the Schwartz and something. I don't know. You need to come up with something. You know, one of the reasons I actually was going to bring you on, not only in the NFL rules here, is that it gave me an excuse to play some sound drops from 1987 classic uh, uh, Star Wars spoof Spaceballs. Are you familiar with this movie at all? Yeah, I think um, that's my family's Bible. Yeah, that and Hitler the World <laughs> Part 1. All right, so I have some, have some... Yeah, exactly. If you want to do... You know, maybe every now and again, I'll just throw in something like... Never underestimate the power of the Schwartz! Yeah, I'll just throw in something again there. Uh, I have like 10 of these saved up. So eventually, as you're coming back on the pod, I'll have a lot to, to use eventually. So, but what I also want to get into for you, it's been a while. You're an intellectual guy. You're a data guy. So before we get into all of your history here, I have a little quiz here because I went through your rivals page. Um, there's an excellent photo on there, which I shared with you, which maybe maybe I'll have them post on YouTube here. We could probably do an hour just on your blonde hair as as part of this of this photo, like the thoughts behind it. When did you come in and out of it? The influences, the reaction. But we'll, we'll get to that another time. But I'm going to I'm going to quiz you on some of the stuff here and you're going to I'm going to see how much this has really sunk in to, 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 to your mind here. So. First, well, let's, let's, let's maybe do easy at first here. So Rivals, how many stars out of five stars were you coming out of, let me see, coming out of 
South Lake, Texas, uh, before before you went to Stanford, offensive of lineman for Stanford, how many stars were you on Rivals.com? I believe I was two stars on Rivals.com. Correct. Two stars. Two stars. So we've we made it here. So far, so good. Like I said, I'm starting starting easy here. Now, this is maybe this is also this is probably an easy one. It's probably burned into your brain a little bit here. How many offers? Now, this is according to rivals.com. So I'm going by what's 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 going on here. You may have some under the table offers, some other things going on here, but how many offers according to rivals.com? According to rivals? Probably six. I think the real number is eight. Six is correct. Uh, six is correct. All right. Maybe that, that was uh, the real number is eight. I know there's some funny business always going on over there, but yeah, you're right. The real number, whatever the real number is, Rivals has here as six offers. Okay. We have to make this a little bit more difficult. This is this is getting too easy here. Um, maybe this is actually easier, but okay. So Stanford committed. Do you know, it says recruited by, and it has a gentleman's name here. Do you know who it says recruited by for Stanford? I don't know who it says by, but I know my recruiting coordinator was Clayton White, Coach White, who I think uh, my mother still sends a Christmas card to. Again, you are correct. Clayton White is is on here. Okay, three for three so far. We're going to we're gonna have to step it up a little bit on this one here. Um, okay. It has here a height and weight listed. Again, this is class of 2008 here, so we're digging back into the future. Can you give me the listed height and weight here for you, Rivals.com? So ironically, this is the hardest one because I don't know how well I fudged my numbers for this because I measured <laughs> anywhere from six. This is to... like a real weigh-in. This is a real weigh-in that you did for them. This is a f- oh, well, come okay, on, real weigh-ins? Come on. There's no such thing as a real weigh-in. Uh, <laughs> Like, come on. Um, I bet they have me at 6'3", 267. So close. So close. 6'3", is correct on here, but 257. So I'm oh, assuming so that that's a, a bad fudge in. job. That's a bad, that was a bad real fudge job. <laughs> I, I, I must – it must have been too early in the morning for me to drink my 10 water bottles or stick a two-and-a-half pound in my girdle. So – yeah, that that's yeah. a rough weigh-in for me. That that my that, brother that probably was pissed that. at me. He was he probably was like, "You didn't do what we talked about." Might have, yeah, that might have that might have affected your your status here. So this again, maybe, I, I don't know how easy or hard this is. But this will be our final final question here. So going back to Stanford here, committed. It has a date here for the date that you committed. I don't know if this date has any significance at all in your mind, but do you remember the date? You officially, according to Rivals.com, uh, uh, committed to Stanford. So um, I don't know because Stanford, they you, you you don't really commit until you get admitted to the school, or at least a player of my caliber. Um, yes. Uh, you know, so uh, they tell you to hold off. So I probably would say August 28th. Mm. Unfortunate there. So it says here October 16th, 2007. Now, okay. So they're they're going back. They're going back here. Maybe that's like a soft commitment, and we'll we'll see sort of thing. But that's what they have here on Rivals.com. But I have to say, I was I'm still impressed. I'm still impressed by by the numbers there. Yeah, I think that's because on the official visit is when like I I was announced that that uh, but I had already gotten admitted before school started because I I really did not want to do any of the homework that said do applications or application help. So because I already got it. Yes. Yeah, Stanford. Stanford's like a real school, a, re- a real school here. Let me see. Now, I, I read some other stuff on here where it looks like the other the other schools we have on here: Colorado State, Kansas, North Texas, Purdue, Tulane, uh, Oregon. It doesn't say there's an offer, but that's also listed on there. Who, 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 where do you think else y- you would have gone? Because I assume, like, you're not just going to go to Stanford if you didn't get an offer there. What, 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 what was the what was your rank ordering? Do you remember? So it's 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 funny. So Oklahoma was probably the school I wanted to most go to. Um, my sister was going there. Um, I w- talked with Coach Stoops and Coach Patton. I mean, Coach Stoops called me Sean, and he didn't remember me. Um, at at, at when that's he what he calls everyone he really all. likes. Those, the prospects yeah. he really likes. That's what he calls them. Yeah, I had a name talk on. He still called me Sean. He didn't even remember me when he, we hired him at the XFL. So maybe I didn't really have a real shot there, even though 
all my enrollment stuff was in the school. Um, uh, what's funny is my brother helped me get recruited. He dropped out of college for a, a semester and said, hey, I'm going to help you do this recruiting process. And um, you can go wherever you want. But if Stanford offers you, you have to go there. And I was like, OK. And he's like, it, I, there wasn't really a choice. He's like, if you I didn't drop out of school so that you could not go to Stanford. So I really didn't have a rank order. And it was what were the best schools? Purdue was probably the best school at the time. Kansas was the best football school, ironically. They were number two in the country with Tommy Reese as the quarterback and Mark Mangino. Very happy I did not go there. Um, but, uh, yeah, Stanford offered. I, I, I committed once I got into the school. Yeah, great, great. Now, again, like I don't want to necessarily go too far back, but I'm very interested in your in your backstory for, for some of the stuff here. Now, you mentioned Stanford. It is – like their recruiting process is a little bit different than some others as far as, you know, being able to like spell your name and kind of like get into some schools versus what you need to do to get into Stanford. So you said like for Stanford, you had to almost be like on the par of some of their students who are being admitted without necessarily having the the football, you know, background there. Although, you know, kind of everyone who goes to Stanford also has all these extracurriculars is, is, an, is an athlete, even if they're not a uh, Division one athlete type of thing. So it's a pretty intense bar to reach academically to go to Stanford. Yeah. And that's what my parents had always put into me was education uh, first and foremost. And I just so happened to go to a high school in Texas when my family moved there. That was a big time football high school. Um, right. I was very fortunate and, and serendipity I had nothing to do other than that. Then, and I was large. So, um, you know, and, then, and so I'd already had that. My parents had already put me in the AP classes. My dad said, hey, you're going to get the same grades regardless, so might as well take these APs. And that's really what helped me get into Stanford was they really look at how hard, how much are you willing to challenge yourself to be able to get in. I had good enough grades to get in. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was tough. We did the same application as everybody else. And, you know, this is back. You had to write it in, but I was – I don't have good handwriting, so I wrote it out and then I printed and scanned it on. So now you get to fill everything out online, but uh, back then you couldn't. Yeah, back then in the olden days, yeah, kids, you'll you'll learn about the dark ages if you're if you're listening in here. Uh, okay, so let's let's talk about Stanford a little bit. So you were there. You played for five years, correct? Yes, uh, I will play. I, I was started for two years, but I was there for five years. Yes. Okay, and you were also there at the same time uh, with as Andrew Luck, which then eventually you go to the XFL and you're working with Oliver Luck. So is is that? just a coincidental situation here or does one kind of bridging to the other as far as you being someone who was identified by the XFL as, you know, they have a little bit more information about you via a V uh, Andrew. Yeah, it was, it was through the connection, right. And like most jobs in sports, that's how you typically get the job. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to be able to play with awesome guys, Andrew, David, DeCastro, Chase Thomas, Griff Whalen, awesome guys who do go on to do a lot of amazing things. Um, and one of them was Andrew. And when Oliver got the job at the XFL, I had been doing product development at a company called Chegg. And him and I had been talking about how do we fix football um, for years going to Andrew's games. And then ultimately when he took this job, he said, hey, Sam, why don't why don't you help change the rules? Uh, but let's put a process in place. Do the same thing you do for product development in the Valley and do it for football. And so that's kind of where I fit in was I was able to kind of say I've done startups before. I was at Chegg when we were about 70 employees up through when we were at 750 um, and kind of saw that growth. And we had a very similar growth while I was at the XFL. Okay. Now, have you been in any book clubs with, with Andrew Luck? Uh, I have uh, been, I've not read, I actually have not read any of his books. I read Dune. So I can't, technically read Dune. Was it, four, was, okay. it, was it four years after Dune was on the book club? Yes. But I still I haven't read Boys in the Boat. I just know he had a book club, which I thought was like the weirdest, well, not weirdest, but it was like the most Andrew Luck thing to have for an NFL football player. So I just, that, that, that's, it's, it's an interesting dude. We, 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 you know, we don't want to get too, too, too much, too far down the, the Andrew uh, path here, but I just thought that that was a, that was a funny thing. So let's, let's talk XFL. So you're brought in there. I saw your presentation. What you mentioned there is that the first time the XFL was launched, it was based upon a lot of assumptions for what people may have wanted, which was this extreme football and hits and, and this and that, that didn't necessarily have enough on-ramping time. So your task when you were put there, you know, reimagining football, it is so vast. Like there are so many different rules. NFL is an extremely complicated game. As someone who now has a couple of young children, it's it, it sinks in like how complicated it is versus if you're watching, you know, a soccer match on television, the kids can kind of figure out what's what's going on, right? You're watching a football 
game on television and there's just a billion different rules to deal with everything. So how did you approach that task of trying to you know, differentiate football, differentiate the XFL, make it a, better in some ways, but then not lose the core of what makes football great. Because obviously people love football. It's the highest broadcast. If you look at the top 20 broadcasts any particular year, it's always 19 or 20 of them are NFL football games. Yeah. Um, I think for me, the first step was, and I think maybe Josh Rosen got knocked for this, but and but I asked why on about every single rule that we had in, in, in the NFL rule book, right? And what, what we weren't doing was making football uh, better by additive properties. We were fixing problems, right? So we didn't want to add laser tag to football, right? Right. That, there, no one asked for that. We were fixing problems like the games are too long or there's too many stoppages or the rules are comp- too complicated. So I wanted to ask why on every single one of the rules. And when you really look at it, we look at, okay, it's a bastardized version of rugby. Right. We're taking the mm-hmm. set piece from rugby, the ruck or the mall, whatever you want to call it, or scrum. And you you now add that that as the base layer of the game. And so going from there, more Walter Camp was changing the rules weekly. Right. And that's where we get to where we are. And there's it's a Frankenstein rule book written by so many different people over so many different years. And, you know, the word unless is in the NFL rule book 74 times. Right. There's all these different aspects that make. The, the rule book really hard, but I wanted to ask why on every single one of our rules. And so um, taking that metric and then we fit that. And once we kind of get a true understanding of the rule book, then we ask fans what they don't like. Right. Again, we didn't ask for what they wanted added, but what they don't like. And we're able to take that information down and we have the, that's our two versions of research. And every time I find out a reason why they don't like it, I ask, go back to the NFL rule book and here's why it's that way. And if they can't get a clear explanation of why it should maintain that way based on how the evolution of the game is, or now it's a TV product because Walter camp did not intend for the super bowl to have 300 million people watch it. Right. He was just doing a collegiate game that he made up. Um, And so that's where we kind of took this process and now said, okay, here's where we can do. And now we can find these different areas. And then we built out pillars of rule change ideology to where every rule change we met had, uh, had to fit one of the pillars that fans had told us. So, the four pillars we had were minimize idle time speed of the game, reduce meaningless plays, create a more dynamic and rhythmic game, and maintain traditional football, but don't make the game have more gimmicks or more dangerous for players. And when we talk about overtime, we'll talk a little bit about you know how you how to balance those last two um, with the game. Yeah, I mean, even even, okay, even like previewing what we'll talk about in in the overtime rules, I think one of the things that can happen with the NFL rule book, and you you mentioned this, is that you are building on top of this foundation at all times. I mean, even here, if like, for instance, if this overtime rule is a, is a superior rule, you know, they're just putting it into the playoffs at this point. They're not changing everything. There are other overtime propositions. And again, we'll go through all this stuff like the shootout or the spot and choose formula that they've talked about. But they're so dramatically different that I think it's harder for the NFL, which has an existing format, which has an existing way of doing things to say this may be superior if we if we just wiped our brains and just came to football not knowing anything. This may be superior, but we're not going to do it because of that reason. Did, did a lot of that sort of thinking go into what you're doing too, is wanting to build off of the NFL? Or did you feel like you had more freedom to start, not from scratch, but to start with what may be inherently a superior idea because you weren't bound to what was already there? Right, exactly. And so um, I, I don't think I ever started from scratch on any idea. I tried to Anyone who thinks product development or ideas come from like a, 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 from thin air is wrong. Every patent is connecting two other things together. Very rarely is something just brand new into the ether. So if you're thinking about how do I find something new, find what other people are doing and kind of take from that. Every single rule in our rule book was baseline NFL, not baseline college or baseline high school or baseline XFL 2001. We were baseline NFL and then we built off of that, right? And what we have is we have – we were going to be the second league. We At no point did we try in this first league to be better than the NFL or be or be or or overtake the NFL, which is something similar to what Vince did in 2001. It said, okay, what can we be to do to be the second best league in this country? And uh, from there, that where I got to try new things. So I watch a lot of Formula One, and the team in second place gets to try more unique strategies than the team in first place because the team in first place is already winning. The NFL does not have to change too many things about their rulebook because they're still the bell cow product in this country. 
versus the NBA. They, they, they experiment with score targets and other unique ideas because they're not as big as the NFL. And the same with the XFL. We had the opportunity to change different things. So I never looked at what we did at the XFL as we were never, I do a lot of car analogies. We're never going to be your Honda Civic that's reliable, get you to work every day. We're not going to be your Corvette supercar. We were going to be your Ford Bronco at your summer house. For three months out of the year, we were really fun and really exciting, and you have great memories of it, but it's not the main product that goes on. At some point, maybe we could get there and elevate ourselves, but we were just something fun and exciting for the football fan to keep having football versus having to be the the bell cow main level product. Okay, well, let's, let, let's talk some XFL changes that you made versus what's in the NFL, and then maybe go through what – principles could be applied to the NFL, maybe if it could be tweaked a little bit, how you think about how it could potentially work in the NFL, because these are always ideas that are coming up more and more. One broad topic that I want to touch on first, because I feel like if I'm going to think of anything, if there is a Achilles heel in the football product, I think it's mostly like performative people's anger about refereeing when it comes to refereeing. But that is the one thing more than anything else, not quality of play, not, you know, even these obscure rules that may go on. I mean, people get a little bit upset about, you know, putting a chip in the ball if we're lining up. But I, I think that's like, again, is a little performative in there. But the refereeing is the one thing, especially on these island games that people go absolutely nuts for. So I think – when it comes to refereeing, you know, maybe there's some principles like you want it to be as objective as possible if you can, you know, reduce subjectivity. You know, there's, there's review and there's other ways to weigh that. So how did you think about refereeing? Was that a big topic that you thought about or was that something that you thought you could adopt a lot of what the NFL has just done? Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, with reimagining the game and the 15 rules that I ended up changing, if all I did was make officiating better, like you said, in the performative sense, I, uh, we would have gotten a pat on the back for, wow, this is great. And I think what we tried to do is on some of the rule changes that we did, like one foot in bounds for a catch, uh, it just tried to make officiating easier, right? It takes half the time to make a catch when you have one foot in bounds, right? It's also a player safety thing by being able to use a foot to guard you instead of landing on your shoulder on out of bounds or on sideline plays. But it was really about how do we minimize the ways to make the officials? Because we knew that we were going to have the same officials as college football, right? We weren't going to go and re reteach officials, right? We weren't going to go out there and say, oh, the, the college football officials aren't good enough. Uh, we're going to go get our own. Uh, that, that, that wasn't what we're going to do year one. We had too many other things to do. And we really wanted to learn about that problem because, you know, I, I came from – I was able to do a lot with officiating. I was able to skirt the rules a lot when I played football. That was kind of my big strategy. There's pictures of me moving the ball forward on fourth down and Stanford center still get yelled at for doing that. Um, right. and, and so, you know, I really need to get to learn these guys. And when you talk to officials, you understand that they've watched more football than anybody and know more about football than anybody, but they may not have been in the highest level uh, meeting rooms. They may not know strategy wise on things they could do. So one of the things we talked about was how do we give, officials better understanding of the gameplay so year two we weren't going to change that many rules because the rules were doing well and uh, we were going to have the officials come full-time and then go into the meeting room and actually learn every team's scheme right really teach them football on top of the already rules that they know and we thought what if they knew how teams were going about their teaching process going about their gameplay process would that make it better at fishing i do not know the answer Right. But that was the kind of the things that we were looking at to try and make officiating uh, better. Uh, objectivity is a very important to me. I bring up the word unless because unless is just a very weird word because it creates more situational calls. I don't like situational calls where it's like, well, this could happen unless this happens. So now you have a rule that flip flops based on scenario. Um, and so in our rules, we didn't have unless. Now we had harder rules that were more sentence structured. So that's a syntax conversation. But you know, we tried, we tried to make it as easy as possible for officials, and then they were part of the rule change process. So guys like Wes Booker, um, Steve Strimley, and all these uh, uh, collegiate officials, they were part of the rule change process. So I built it with them. And talking with them, they hadn't ever been asked to do that. So one of our officials actually came up with our short yard or our chain issue uh, situation where you take the chains out was he said, if you start every series on a new yard line, you don't need the chains as many times. So we started every every new set of downs on a new yard on an exact yard line. We moved the ball up. We always had to move it up versus move it back. And so over time, yeah, there's some yardage snuck in between their half yardage. 
But this way we didn't have to use the change as much because we already had an exact line of it. It's subjectivity on where you can get the ball down versus where the ball, it's all eyeballs there. So did I have a five-year plan to use gyroscopes to measure guys down? I, all these different aspects, optical tracking to get them be taking to take the tip of the ball and then counteract that with chip. Yeah, but all we had to do was move the ball up to the nearest yard line and we really eliminated our problem. We had three measurements in 20 games. So, you know, I think that's a way to kind of think differently. And when you talk to officials, you'll be able to go find new issues that way. Yeah, no, I love bringing the officials in on it because, I mean, I, I'm naturally a contrarian thinker, which it doesn't make you very popular on you know social media when everyone's bitching about the the calls that, that are happening. But in my opinion, like it's hard, right? Like it's hard to be a rep and and to do these things in real time. So like bringing them into the decision making process, I love because it at least helps them bridge that gap a little bit better between what is like humanly possible and what is um envisioned by whoever are are putting together the rules so so i love that now i'm interested in this in this spotting thing i'm i don't know that's a little bit of a tangent we probably don't need but i'm going to go into it anyway so if you had the ball and you were like fourth and in inches from the goal line and you didn't succeed would the other team start all the way back at the one yard line then going back versus being versus being inches away from their own end zone yeah probably Okay, interesting. Anyway, it would be a, it'd be a visible one. We didn't have that situation come up, I don't believe. But yeah, yeah that, it, it would be because right, you you are right. Inches and yards are they're very one yard is a very different uh, play. Um, but we probably would have started them at the yard line just because that's kind of our mentality. It's also a, a the, we had a ball spotting official, and that was their main job. Was they chose? No, no, I, I think it makes sense. It's just like something to think because I was thinking about on the other end rarely like getting a first down inside of the 10 yard line anyway. So maybe you would have the ball at the, you know, the 11 and a half move up to the 11 or something like that. So there'd be a little movement there. Maybe if there's a penalty inside the 10 yard line, you can make an incremental difference. That was the one thing I was thinking about that would actually change like my strategic thinking on that. So, so that's very interesting. So we have, so we have refereeing. What do you think is the next, maybe we'll just go by what you think was the most successful thing that you implemented in the XFL regardless of whether you think it is the most transferable concept to the NFL. Yeah. So um, one of the things Oliver preached at the start was trying to be the stewards of the game, right? Uh, Oliver spent a lot of time in Germany studying German soccer and the German government dictates how soccer is played inside Germany from the youth level all the way up to the um, professional level. And so he thought, well, there's not that way in football. There's, you know, UIL in Texas plays different high school football than high school football in, in Arkansas and their neighboring states, right? And, you know, it, it, there isn't no one that's kind of said, here. here's the exact rule book. And so he thought, what if we make the game better for players and fans and we become the stewards of the game? And so one of the things I think is important is the kickoff. Um, our kickoff was really successful. Uh, be, being from the success metrics of the NFL has 40% return rate. We had a 93% return rate. We had zero injuries on 400 kickoffs over our entire testing period. Uh, uh, in 100 kickoffs, we had zero injuries um, during our uh, our games. And the uh, NFL, you're three times more likely to get injured on their kickoff than any other play. So we really created like a scrimmage play. I'm not saying our, your, no one will ever get hurt on the kickoff I created in, in 2020, but I think that uh, it really shows that you can make the game more, uh, more exciting and safer for players. And those are really big tenets that people wanted. And we weren't too gimmicky. We kept the foot in football. We didn't do the fourth and 12 conversion tactic on onside kicks. You elected to kick deep or you elected to onside kick because we wanted to keep that integrity of the game versus having like kind of a more gimmicky type play um, that could happen. I think really that rule, um, I believe, should be played at the high school level. I believe it should be played at the collegiate level because it just makes the game safer for everybody. And it really gets back to the basics of football, which is, you know, playing a strategic game. And we don't necessarily need to, like 2001 thought, have the highest speed collisions and the biggest hits. Yeah, yeah. Now, just just to clarify and to kind of like lay it out, I know we're in a podcast format, so it's a little bit difficult to, to do. So for, for the XFL kickoff, basically the uh, kicking team – all of their blocker, I mean, all of their, uh, you know, potential, I don't know what you call them. Uh, coverage uh, team. Or team. Coverage team, right. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So the coverage team versus the versus the blocking team, everyone is it's kind of compressed. They're all kind of compressed together further down the field, closer to where the returners are so that you're eliminating the big ramp up. So you don't have these two, you know, 250-pound uh, jacked, 
freight trains basically running into each other with a 40 yard lead uh, lead dash going into it. That's kind of the, the primary innovation, but I'm sure there's other things that I'm missing there. Yeah. Yeah. So what we did is we looked at the reason why there were so many concussions and injuries on the uh, kickoff. And it was because we started 10 yards apart, sprinted 35 yards and then created a, a collision. We called that a high velocity impact play. No other play in football or really sports. Do you have a situation like that? And so I watched uh, hundreds of kickoffs and paused the film every time the uh, what where what it looked like when the ball was caught, and every time the coverage team and the return team were facing each other five three to seven yards apart at the thirty five and the thirty, right? And I said, yeah. why don't we just start the play from there? Um, if yeah. we always end up there, and so I thought, <clears throat> okay, what are the un- unintended consequences that come from that? Well. You now can't have a surprise onside kick because how are you supposed to onside it there or onside kick? Because how do you, there's no formation to onside it because they're not starting the 10 yards apart anymore on the kick yeah. deep. And so I thought, okay, how many plays are onside kicks? And that's 1%. And you, so I said, okay, we'll elect to kick it deep or elect to onside. Well, now we lose the surprise onside kick, which is one of the most exciting plays in football. Well, it's 1% of onside, 1% of kicks are onside kicks, 1% of those are, uh, or surprise onside. So for a basis point of football, we create a, a play that induces concussions three times more than every ever play. That's really at the end of the day what it does. So I thought, okay, we can sacrifice that part of the game to now have a, a safer kickoff because you eliminated that run up, that high velocity impact play, and they end up at the same spot. Now, what was really scary was what is it going to look like? How are these players going to react? How are the coaches going to react? What is it? What does it even look like? And you don't. What you don't want is we don't want to have the players start further back than they normally do. So the 28 yard line was our goal. That's where the average NFL uh, uh, series starts. So we ended up at the 31, right? So everyone who thinks, Oh, this is, yeah, it was great because everyone, every coach or player I talked to said, Oh, this is going to be way too good for the, for the offense. or this is going to be way too good for the defense. No one had consensus. And I was the only one that was like, I have no idea. <laughs> You know, right, like, right, yeah. Like, like who, who knows? This is brand new. Like, no one can make an assumption off of this. So that's why we had to test the rule, and we ended up exactly where we wanted. We had two kickoff returns for touchdowns and a hundred kicks. That's about the percentage that we want to have for returns for touchdowns. We had the same average spot uh, as the NFL. So it was. It really, to me, it's like that was a proven success of a rule. Yeah, and it, it doesn't become just like an extended commercial break, right? For as it would be in the NFL now. One of the things that you mentioned in your presentation, and it, it was the ability to test on the field. Because again, when we're talking about major rule changes, and this is something that's going to prevent the NFL from making a major rule change, is the series of second, third order effects, unintended consequences, incentives that may be misaligned with what you, you thought they were, or at least misaligned with making the game more exciting. Maybe in some weird way, it'll make the game less exciting that you didn't even think about in that sort of way. So, like, I don't know, can the NFL do something like that? Though, like, can the NFL really test things that they want to implement a change for? I think it would be very useful if they could do something like that. But what, what they've chosen to do is an incrementalism, maybe with the, the, the belief that you can't replicate NFL football in some other manner to test it. But I, I'm, I'm just not sure. Maybe they are testing things that I don't even know about. Well, what's your opinion there? Yeah, um, in the words of Oliver Luck, operational issues should never stand in the way in, in front of success, right? So if it's an operation, then you then you can get it done. So we our first rules testing session with the uh, National Junior College Association, uh, uh, Athletic Association, so the NJCAA, and we paid them ten grand. We paid um, Pearl River Community College and Mississippi Gulf Coast ten grand, and we took over their um, their teams for three days. Right. And we, that was our first rules testing session. So I don't think it's a, an issue for the NFL to do something similar with an organization. We then worked with semi pro leagues where we paid them, where we had an in kind sponsorship that we did different things to be able to say, Hey, let's test our rules there. Right. And so anything's possible. If you have enough money, you have enough operational excellence, you can get anything done. And so I, I don't think it's a, an issue. I think that they have to look at college football and other things. And again, they mostly make rule changes based on uh, you're talking like singular play fan fervency, right. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, player safety. Those are really the only things. So they have the DPI OPI uh, review call, which was based off of one really bad play. And then the, you have overtime uh, in the playoffs, which, you know, was probably two games this past year 
Um, but again, you're sol- those are really small problems to solve, but they have really big impact. So, I, I, you know, I don't know if they need to do rules testing everywhere. I would, because I, 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 I'm constantly thinking, you know, if the age of my fan is getting older and older and I have to compete with other places, I'm constantly thinking about innovating. Um, in the Valley, the big story is uh, Polaroid was worth the same amount of money as it, with the day Instagram was bought for a billion dollars, but they had 3,000 employees versus 13 employees at Instagram. Right. So you're, you're going to be passed up. So you might as well innovate now. Um, and so I, I kind I, I think they should innovate. I think there's definitely ways to innovate and test things. And, you know, we tested probably uh, 25 rules made the testing, only 15 made it into the game. We started with 100 rules, 100 rules. Most of the rules didn't get past our data set. Right. OK, this is never going to work. And, and, our, and our experts saying, yeah, this this is not how you, you can't do this. You can't have eligible receivers. But in ultimately testing you get a lot of the game strategy. The Mississippi uh, junior colleges were great because we had a completely running clock throughout the entire game and end game scenario. Uh, one of the teams got back in punt formation and ran around in punt formation and then threw the ball as high as they could out of bounds because it took off more clock than just kneeling. <laughs> right. Right. And so, right. okay. I, I, I Look, that's a very simple rule to try and think of. Like that's something I could have thought of, but there was a hundred other things I was doing and we didn't think of that. So, we got. We now said, okay, the clock has to stop after incompletions. The clock has to stop after out of bounds, and then we ultimately were able to get to our game clock um, because we just we couldn't account for everything in there. We need to see these things on the field. No, that 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 goes into right. What was my next question was going to be is, you know, you can test things, especially on a short time frame, like you mentioned. You have a few, you have a few days to work with them. You can test things to see if they work when executed in a manner that you thought they would be executed, but it doesn't necessarily give coaches and maybe players or enough time to, you know, poke holes in the rules. You know, you mentioned an example where someone did and that can happen because that's also a big risk, right? As you implement a new rule, normally you're not going to make a mid season change to a rule. So if you implement a rule that has a lot of potential ways that it can go, even if you test it, someone may not figure out, Uh, a leak in the rule until you know midway through the season and then it'll still apply for the rest of the season yeah i mean i was finding bugs right that was it was anyone who's in product development or you know in engineering i was trying to find as many bugs as possible and even during the season you know everyone's patting us on the back you your football ops you guys did a great job I, i i still had weekly meetings with my core team to say what are we doing wrong because we have to find things that we're doing wrong or else someone else will right and there there are bugs in every game and every time you have to do it, you have to patch those and you don't want to end up with spaghetti code, which is what the NFL and all football rule books have right now is a bunch of spaghetti code because you have rules that counterbalance each other. There are still rules in the NFL rule book against the T formation. Right. And so, you know, it was like, because that, that was a problem that was creating injuries earlier. So now we have to have different things because you have to sway the rules certain ways. So, you know, you really, it's really hard and you have to get on the field. And like you said, there is different play speeds, right? Our punt rule, created uh, fewer punts uh, and I thought I was really nervous. It was going to have uh, too many touchdowns or too many big returns. Well, it just didn't. If I think in the NFL, if they, if we gave them 11 yards distance instead of uh, uh, XFL players having 11 yards distance, there might be more touchdowns if Cordell Patterson's back there or if Tyree kills back there. Right. And so, you know, there's not, not every rule change that we did is going to be guaranteed to be a great rule in the NFL. So, you do have to test every single rule and you do get more. But what's great is, you know, the, we were at eight coaches and eight teams and I hired them. Every single coach was hired at least in June when we kicked off the next February. So they were part of at least three testing sessions. Most coaches were involved in five testing sessions with our rule book. And so now all oh, these guys are part of the process to create the rules and they're trying to poke holes. Now you have to, when you're communicating with coaches, it's their, it's their livelihood online in their mindset. So they're always thinking from the personal standpoint and not the macro standpoint, not the fan, not the player, right? They're thinking about how do I maintain my job? And so moving them off status quo is much harder than moving fans and players off status quo. And so you have to kind of read through their conversations. Are they really making an a argument over this rule being bad uh, and bad for the game? Or are they making a rule is they can't adapt to the rule? So you have to you have to adjust and kind of manage that situation. Yeah, I mean, and if we know anything about coaches, at least when it comes to like on field strategy and other things, like there's a heavy bias towards tradition, right? And and the safety of that and the safety of that in some ways, even though like t- technically 
the more change there is, the more opportunity there would be for someone to enhance their results by, you know, by, by having the, the ideal solution to a lot of these, a lot of these new problems. Okay. So that's okay. So we got the kickoff. I know we got a little off track on that, but that was a very interesting discussion on the, some of the issues behind it. What, what else would you say are your, are your favorite things and, and whether or not they could be implemented in the, in the NFL? Uh, probably my favorite thing was our coach to player communication system. And it wasn't like there's a few things the NFL should take right away. And there's a few things that it, 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 you know, it doesn't, it may not want to, but I love that we expanded it from one to one to one to many on uh, our, our coach to player communication. So in the NFL, you have one uh, play caller for per each side of the ball. They communicate in the play to one player, uh, most often the quarterback, I think always the quarterback right now in the NFL. And then they communicate the play in the huddle to the rest of the team. Uh, we had it for every single player. Technically, you could do signals and signs like college football does, uh, but those get stolen. So you don't have, you can't steal the communication process. So you have a more uh, fair, uh, fair game. What what we, what I love about it is it eliminated the huddle, so the game could move faster. And so we were able to get the same number of plays as the NFL or meaningful plays in the as the NFL in two hours and fifty minutes on average. Versus the NFL averages three hours and 18 minutes, right? So you're seeing the same game just without the huddle. And I think it really speeds the game up, but doesn't take away the integrity of the game. So we ran a play every 23 seconds. NFL runs a play every 31 seconds. And so, and in their two minute warning, they run a play every 23 seconds. So our game was like the two minute warning. It had that frenetic pace, but also it was still controlled. All the players could figure it out. We also didn't have a cutoff uh, on our, our coach to player communication system. Uh, like the NFL has a cutoff with 15 seconds left. That's to make sure that there's like a, a, so the quarterback's not calling or getting the play call from the quarter uh, coordinator too late or making all the adjustments. Well, a lot of teams already do that. You'll see the teams that snap the ball before 15 seconds of the play clock more often than the other teams. It's because the coordinator is helping them make the adjustment at the field. So it's just a manipulation of the rules where you're going to still get a desire, a different result from different coaches. So I loved what we did on coaching play communication. It's just expanding it, making the game, uh, not restricting the game, but opening it up. Okay, so a few few things I'll I'll talk about as far as whether this would translate to the NFL or not. Number one, um, you know there was this whole thing with Jared Goff and Sean McVay as if it was like Goff is is just a the an arm and a body, and McVay was like his brain and and telling him everything. So I could see some complaints about that. Whatever, I think I think that's kind of nonsense. So I don't, I don't think that's a big deal. Number two, from a technical aspect, and maybe this is something that that if whether you had issues with this or not. One of my concerns would be if you're going from player communication from one to one to one to 11, then there are 10 additional potential technical malfunctions that you can have. And then if one player is has a malfunction, then there's a whole issue there. Maybe if, if every helmet is wired, then you don't have to worry about like, where's the green dot helmet? You can just slap another helmet on them and it doesn't really matter. What, what was that? Was there ever an issue with that? Okay, yeah. So this was the, my hardest problem to solve was game timing and, and ultimately coach to player communication. So yes, yeah, so now we get to go and let's peel the bandaid off. So yeah, first one number one was what was my main goal from coach to player communication, and that was speed the game up. And it was based it was like our entire process of our game was being able to go faster than the NFL and get get plays, get the points, everything. So my number one rule is reliability, right? I not go for the best technology, which I got, I got caught up in trying to have the best technology. Number one rule was always reliability. So I looked at the NFLs and what their system has, and they had four different systems or they had five points of failure really between how their, their coach me uh, to player communication system go off the battery in the helmet, the battery in the belt pack. Then you have the uh, coach to coach system is different than the coach to player system. So you have to connect those two together. And then you have the, uh, repeater, which is the cutoff switch that, that that makes it so you can't do it. So all these systems and the coach to coach, all five systems have those five points of failure and it breaks quite often, right? And it's on a 900 megahertz radio frequency, um, which for we, we have to get radio frequency controllers at every game to make sure there's no drones, right? But you know what else is on 900 megahertz frequency? Baby monitors. You can't go tell the baby monitor Hey, you have to change your radio frequency, right? <laughs> right football game is right. important, but your baby's not as important as my football game. You don't get to do that. So you're going to have interference in some locations that are in rural areas or in, in domestic areas. So 
you're going to have uh, uh, problems with the, with the system. And like you said, there are more points of failure. So I looked for the most reliable system. We ended up going with Procom, a system used in high school football. It's a completely wireless system. We were able to connect that to our debt network frequency system with the in Riedel. So if anyone watches Formula One, the Riedel headset uh, is on there. The deck network is a is a, a restricted band of, of frequency. That is what your uh, your at home wireless phone is. So that connects you to your base, so that there's no disruptions. This is getting very nerdy right now, but everything about what we try to do is create reliability. Like you said, if each helmet's wired, we tried a wired system, but now I have to double buy helmets. So what we did is going with Procom was a modular system that was literally just Velcro in and out. One helmet goes down, we go and put it back in. And we didn't get too dangerous or too risky with it. So I really wanted to have every coach can talk to their own position group. I wanted to have different channels. I wanted to have each coach be wired up. But year one, it was all about reliability. So we had one coach on either side of the ball and the head coach could talk to either side of the ball. They talked to everyone at once. You couldn't choose whether you talked to just the quarterback. We could have made it that way. Um, but it was all about reliability. So if one person's headset goes down. Now, we had some issues in games. We had a coding issue on, on one back end um, that I had a swing coach. And then we ended up fixed by week three. But it was only the, where sometimes a coach could hear the call that he wasn't supposed to hear, right? And so uh, it didn't actually affect the players on the field, which was important for us versus the coach having a quality of life issue. Um, and so, you know, yes, reliability was a huge piece. because, and, and I'm also one of those people where you can – really try and solve for one thing at a time. And once you get that, you check that off. And as you create new opportunities, you have to make sure you don't lose your original aspect, right? It's just the same, same way I work as a player. Whatever I'm good at, I need to keep doing that. As I add new things to my game, I can't lose that part of my game. So if you're a good run blocker and you're working on your pass pro, you can't lose your good run blocking as you're working on pass pro. And so it's that same mindset with product development. You can't lose what you makes you great. And reliability was our number one thing for that. And because yeah, you're right, you're now added Although I removed four points of failure, I now added 10 more by having them all on the field at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Now, let's go back to actually the, this whole McVay Goff thing just for a second. Because I can see the other thing. So if there's no cutoff during the play, they can, mm -hmm. they can, they can talk to them. And that, that would be the other thing people would say, like, oh, the coach is like, hit your check down or you're about to get sacked or whatever during, during the play. I feel like that is much overhyped. Like people would overhype the ability of the coach to react and get it in there in his ear and then process and everything else. W was there any shenanigans in that regard going on? Well, uh, yeah. And so, you know, it's, hmm. I'm going to do it a different way. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to get myself in trouble. Uh, yeah, you do. Uh, that was one of those spirit of the game rules. I play a lot of ultimate Frisbee growing up and uh, this, they, uh -huh. before they added officials, you had a spirit of the game and it's like, Hey guys, don't do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But you, yeah. But you, but you, but you do that when you can't solve a problem. <laughs> right. Right. Cause I, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I, I don't want to add a repeater and could do the cost switch. So it's really, what was great is it happened week one and you, and we, what, what the other thing I love about our coach players, we put all the play calls over the air. Right. So people could get right. better at watching football. Right. We had 185 million fans. 38 million of those wanted more football. Those are who we were going after. We weren't getting new sports fans. We weren't getting non-football fans. We are getting the, the big football fans. So my main goal was edutainment. How do I make people better at watching football? I think the same thing goes for this podcast. Is It's making people understand the data behind the game better and make us better at enjoying football, whether it's from a fantasy gambling or just interesting standpoint. So, uh, you know, and so that's what we were doing. But then Coach Pat, my, my offensive coordinator, DC Defenders head coach, he's yelling at Cardell and all the offensive players because they didn't have a, a channel, right? Yeah, They're yeah, separate. yeah. He's yelling at Cardell mid 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 play, right? I think yeah. first series. Well, Cardell self policed it. I got it. I got it. Let me do it. Yeah. Let me do it. And so, <laughs> right. what was great is I couldn't solve it from a technical standpoint. Um, the coaches still did exactly what you said, but the players policed it. No player is going to want a coach yelling at him mid play. It's going to screw him up. Just because you get emotionally hijacked doesn't mean that it's going to make it a little bit different. And so that was unique. One of those awesome things, like I, I could have spent so much time, so much stress trying to solve this problem, but really I just had to trust the players to kind of self-police it themselves. Yeah, no, that, that, yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. I feel like it's like in theory it works. In practice, these guys would have to be practicing it all the time in order for it to, to work during a game. You can't just like in the middle of the game, you've been playing football one way your whole life as a quarterback and then expect to be able to, to react and trust what you're hearing, all that stuff. So one the caveat, I say we put it in every player's helmet, but we didn't put it in the offensive line's helmet. And I'll tell mm -hmm. you why. 
uh, at the start. When we showed this to fans, some fans got upset, but not for the Jared Goff reason, but because in football, fans have the biggest impact uh, on the outcome of the game of any other sport because of crowd noise. Mm -hmm. And so okay. the real problem was what if the coach started doing the play count or the, uh, the, 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 the snap count? Right. right. And now everyone's getting off the ball and now it doesn't matter how loud the crowd is. Right. And so that was a bug that we had to work out and make sure that we didn't have it in every player's helmet. Right. So, you know, a, one team put it in the center's helmet. It got too hard to police what to do. And you don't want to have that coming up too much. So uh, but the, uh, the tackle still didn't have it in their helmet. So, you know, that was one thing that we thought about was maybe at some point every player does get it in their helmet. But for year one, we definitely didn't want to because we wanted to feel like the crowd was still part of the part of it and th that they didn't have that issue. No, that, that's a great idea. And plus, you know, the quarterback can kind of communicate with the line or all punched in there the, a little bit. Easier, the model huddle. Right? Most most offensive linemen yeah. don't need the actual play call. Um, you know, the center does and sometimes the tackles do for the long pass plays. Right. So at Stanford, all the weapons were the long or animals were long pass plays. So that was like that was like, hey, hang in there type of call um, versus. Um, you know, other play calls might just be a regular like midfield seven or five step drop. So you don't need the whole play call. So model huddle is very easy where the O line's already at the line of scrimmage. Quarterback just says one number and you move on. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I love it. Um, this is not really your department here, but my thought is like I'd love to see some of these changes, speeding up the game, doing this and that. But let's face it, you know, a little dollars and cents here. Like the NFL is highly incentivized. These are the most you know watch broadcasts that there are. You know. If they could, I bet they'd be trying to throw in ways to make them longer with, if the fans were not upset about it to try well, to well, maybe even make more money, right? Well, the problem is, is what do, why, why is, why does NBC pay so much money for the NFL? Right? Because so many people uh, watch it. Well, mostly it's because of the lead into their other shows where they make all their money, right? They don't net enough money from the NFL, right? If so, the NFL would have its own streaming uh, service like Netflix and they would sell their own ads, right? But what happens is the networks really use the NFL and football in general as a way to have lead-ins to their other shows. ESPN is different because that is all they do is in live That's a good point. You know, they do advertise a ton for their own network during the shows. Yeah, so you know, just like college football, why the Rose Bowl is so important to universities is because that's the, when you're in the Rose Bowl, that's the year you get the most applications into your school. The same thing goes for um, – networks and, and i spent a lot of time on the networks um i was the main liaison before len mead took over um but with the networks and that was a big th that's a big thing for them is how do we have the the number one lead and how do we get people that's why apple tv is making the investment into baseball they want people to use the service more the games are going to be free on apple tv right but yeah. they want people to get used to the muscle memory of how do i get there now i get to see coda now i get to see ted lasso now i'm going to want to purchase so you really, you pay these big dollar amounts for uh, live sporting events. You don't turn as much of a profit on them. And you try to, as as you could on your other basic shows where you own the rights, you own the, the distribution rights afterwards. You're getting paid on it as TBS picks up your sitcom. That's why they always premiere a brand new show after the Super Bowl, because that's the likelihood you're going to have the lead in for the most eyeballs. Yeah, no, no. And, and then if you think about it, like now we're like TV execs here. But um, if you think about it, like pay, you're willing to pay more per ad dollar for a sports broadcast because there's less uncertainty too right like when when you're when you're launching a show a, a sitcom it's got like a one in ten chance of being a success and a huge hit and it's got a probably even less than that and it, whereas if you if you're paying for you can kind of just pencil in what your ratings are going to be what the effect is going to be what the certainty is going to be so in that way your margins are you're willing to accept lower margins in a way because you're you're taking on less less risk there. Okay. Yes. All right. Let's get, pissed let's get... because we just became the number one sports business podcast. <laughs> yeah. Well, we need to come up with better yeah. tweets to to get dunked on and uh, shared shared throughout the universe. Um, okay. Let's let, let's hit the actual NFL rule here. So there's been some discussion on Twitter about it. Let me just let me make sure I have the details right about it. So again, overtime only. You mentioned, you know, based upon what we've seen a couple of instances, and I think it's definitely the Bills not having a chance to touch the ball against the Chiefs, going back to, you know, even 2016, and in the Super Bowl, the Falcons not having a chance to touch the ball there. But it goes a little bit deeper than that, in that it's, it's a lot of randomness in this, but in the playoffs, 
I think the last 12 overtime games in the playoffs, 10 of them have been won by the team that receives the ball first, I believe on that first possession. So it was, we're there on like a hot streak, a big hot streak. I think streak it's, it's seven of 12 first possession, 10 of 12 oh. overall. 10 to 12. That, that makes more sense. Yes. Because yeah, 10 of 12 would have been, would have been ridiculous. Okay. So, but still, if you figure like during an actual NFL game, a team scores a touchdown about 25% of the time uh, on a, on a possession. So we're still talking about seven out of 12 times that, that a team that's had scored uh, on their first possession there. Okay. So the proposal and maybe we'll talk about first, there was a Titans proposal, which was if you score a two on a first touchdown, then you would win on the first possession. That was kind of thrown out because the main rub here, the main point that everyone wanted to fix was the fact that every team doesn't have a possession. So the rule that is being adopted now is that the everyone has at least one possession. So one team gets the ball, regardless of what happens on that possession, whether it's a punt, whether it's a you know, turnover, whether it's a field goal, whether it's a touchdown, the other team has a chance to get the ball back. And then if the score is tied after two possessions, it becomes sudden death. So after two touchdowns, after two field goals, after two punts, after two turnovers, whatever, it, it is sudden death on that point. So now the discussion comes into play. And what's interesting about it, I think initially, my reaction is maybe this is a pretty good rule because people can't quite decide whether they would want to be first or second, where it was clearly obvious they would want to be first in the past. What do you, well, What is your initial opinion on A, do you like the rule change? I've seen some people complaining about the rule change, but again, you know, this is like social media where there's performative complaints about everything. And number two, do you have an initial read on whether you'd want to be first or second and h- how do you come to that decision? Right, so using Sam... 2018 brain this was a non-starter for me because i had to be under three hours guaranteed right we Mm -hmm, were like a a, a, like a block for what you'd have for a movie on tnt that's how we were is you're getting off they are switching in the contract they said they could switch the channel during our games and so the heidi game um is always referenced as the game that was switched off in the middle of it people didn't know the the end of it because they want to get into heidi that's what we i was up against so i had to be out under three hours so that was my goal we had one game that went over as we got closer to the season, the coaches, the, the networks were like, yeah, you can be over three hours. That's okay. If it's, if it's overtime, that means it's a good game. I was like, oh, my God. I just spent eight, 20 months working on this thing. And, <laughs> and this is like the right. hardest part of my job. And so uh, my brain initially goes there like, wow, this is going to be way too long. You're now extending the game. My other part of my brain says this is a, play, this is a backwards player safety rule because you're now guaranteeing more plays. Player safety, players can get hurt not playing in plays, but you're guaranteed to have an opportunity for a player to get hurt if you have a play, right? And so right. as you're Well, this is probably some of the rationale behind not putting it into the regular season at, the, at, the, at this point, at least. Absolutely, right? And, and I think the real problem is the math tells you it's a fairness issue, or there's no fairness issue in the regular season. There's only a fairness issue in the playoffs right now because those teams, you know, are mismatched. And a week, everyone knows week one body type is not the same uh, on defense. It's not the same as the week... 2021 body type that you have so we want to solve for that that later end of the season so uh i I thought about that way and then i really don't like college football over time because it's Mm -hmm. not fair Mm -hmm. some years it's up to 62 percent win rate for the team that goes second it's based on information gained so the example i always use and coach stoops did not like me using this example is the one of the greatest game ever is fiesta bowl uh in 2006 boise state oklahoma you go to overtime, Oklahoma loses the cost, toss, they go first. First play, 97 zone, Adrian Peterson goes to the house. They then have to kick the one-point play. Then Boise State gets the ball, they get to fourth down, they run a hook and ladder, and then they score a touchdown, and then they do Statue of Liberty and win the game with a two-point conversion. If the coin toss had flipped, that first fourth down, Boise State has to kick a field goal. And we know, based on every play being a vacuum in college football, 97 outside zone, Adrian Peterson scores on the first play. We now have a different outcome of the game just because of the coin toss. So I, I'm thinking about it. Oh, I really don't like this rule. But the more I think about this NFL rule. Well, let, let, let me ask one thing real quick. One, one yeah. thing real quick on the college system, because I think amongst like, you know, people who are nerd friendly, like our, like ourselves, it's kind of a known fact that the informational advantage you get from going second in college football actually throughout a longer history, not just looking at these these playoff games that we've seen in the NFL, but over a long history, gives you an even bigger advantage than the cur- what was the current, uh, which was the, what's still the regular season system for, for overtime. But 
if you're a league, are you optimizing for actual fairness or are you optimizing for the fans and the players and the coaches perception of fairness? Cause they may perceive that to be more fair, even if it isn't more fair. Right. Um, I did both. Uh, sports okay. wagering was a big part of our game. And so I was concerned with both. I mean, I did not like college overtime and my team in 2011 was, even though we lost in an overtime game, we were statistically the best overtime team or red zone team in the country. Almost ever. We were 99, 98 and 99 or 99 and 99 scoring in the red zone. And we were 75% touchdown in the red zone. Having Andrew Luck and David Castro on our team are very good for scoring. Um, and so I was like, I'm still against what college overtime did because it was different. Now this is the full drive. So no points are guaranteed on a drive or point attempts like it is in college football, where you always mm-hmm. are having uh, a field goal attempt at a, at least a 52 yarder, unless you move way back, but you, you always will get a, 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 a point try versus this. You actually get the full drive of the core gameplay. The problem is, is that this takes what we normally do is race against the clock with points. And now we do score targets and score targets is a different way to do it. Also college football has a fairness mechanic in it where they know going second is bad or is better than the going first. So they let you go second on uh, defense if you went first on offense in the first round. We don't right, have flips. that in the new. So it's an ABBA right. um, pattern versus right now we have an ABA. So with no points guaranteed or point attempts guaranteed in this version, and you get you have information advantage, but if the other team kicks a field goal and you get in field goal range as a second team, you have this thought process of if I kick a field goal right now, now they have sudden death. Versus I can go for it here. It depends on my percent chance I'm going to convert. I now may pass over the attempts because now I know that they get the sudden death versus in college football, you know, you have rebuttal guaranteed. So it's a, it's a, it's why I kind of like this rule as long as you are stomach the added plays is wow. Like I actually don't know <laughs> what the best version is. I don't know yeah. what the model is going to be because there's so many factors because it's so unique and new. And it sounds stupid. Just giving an extra possession is it is new, but I have no real basis of history to base it on. Cause it's not exactly the same as college football. I have no real model that tells me exactly what the perfect thing to do based on situation football at the end of a game. Right. And I, I Ben Baldwin's going to, his ears are going to burn, but there is some feeling in players at the end of that game where your body is ba- made to play 60 minutes, not play, you know, however many minutes they extra they're going to add. Right. Like yeah, the guys who warm up four hours before the game, they've been in foot knee braces, football pads for eight hours, you know? So it, it's, it's, it's a different game and, um, and it's postseason. So I love they did postseason only because that means they're identifying which, which part of the game they need to solve. I think it's okay to have postseason only rules. Uh, we didn't have them. XFL 2001 did have them. Um, but I think, you know, I, I think that's not too gimmicky to have that. Um, we did the two point conversion shootout from the five yard line where our two point conversion was. I think it, it's the fairness. That's the fairest for both players and fans. We remove the core gameplay of the drive, but, and we, we go to a pseudo score target, but, um, I think it just it's a ability to get in and out faster without maximizing the number of plays that people have. But I, I do like what the NFL is doing by making this the perceived fairness as well as I do not know what's more fair right now. Yeah, no, I, I think I like the shootout is probably my favorite. But again, the NFL is just going to be reticent to shift things too far in, in one direction or another. What I think is the most interesting part of this was number one, I, I do wish it was the regular season because I just want to see what happens. More right. often. We, need more, we need more information, you know, like, need uh, more information because this is like the ultimate game theory in a way, because there is an optimal strategy when it comes to the, what the first team should do. If they score a touchdown, as far as a two point conversion, which is go for one. And maybe I'll go into that a, a little bit more, but and there is an optimal strategy if that first team scores a touchdown and goes for one. There is an optimal strategy for what the second team should do when they, if they score a touchdown to tie it, which is go for two. Mm-hmm. Always. You should always do those two things. There's no circumstances under which you should not do those two things. The question is, is your opponent going to do that or not? Yes. Because, because like, if you're saying – even if you thought that using optimal strategy going first is better – and there are reasons why that may be the case. I think second is better, but again, there may be reasons why the case, especially if there's a weather element to it, because you might want to choose side versus choosing, mm-hmm. taking, you know, whatever, whatever it may be, right? There's all these different things that come into it. But so if, if you thought that was better, you still might not want to take it if you thought there was a possibility 
that the other team would go for two at the end of their drive because we've heard there was already a tweet by Tom Pelissaro talking about some coaches saying, oh, I think a lot of coaches are going to go for two after that after that first possession, where if you do that, it's like you're it's like the, it's like the reverse of the go for two down eight thing. You're giving the other team more information. You're not ending the game with the two. You're giving the team more information. So when you don't score 50 percent of the time, they just need an extra point. Whereas if you do score the 50 percent of the time, you're still they, they can go. They know they have to go for two. So you're giving them that sort of advantage. I, I need to get the details. But anyway, but if you thought there was a possibility they would go for two, you would let them hang themselves in the same way as if you thought there was a possibility the second team wouldn't go for two, you would let them hang themselves. So like, which, figuring that out is the most interesting thing for me. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm loving it too because now we have to account for the human element, right? We don't – everyone doesn't just go off the spreadsheet like they like I would, right? At least yes. in, if, I, if I was a GM or a head coach for a year, I would look at my owner and say, I'm going to do as many crazy things year one. The reason why you hired me is because something bad happened with the last regime. I have job security. You're not going to pay me for four years to not work for you, right? There, there's like different things you could do when you have job security. And, and, but I, I think, you know, we don't know what each team's going to do. I think that a coach put that information out there so other coaches start questioning it. That was so preposterous that I think it's strategy. <laughs> I don't I don't know about that. Because we, coaches love going for two at the very end of games and overtime. They hate it the rest of the time, but they love it. Yeah. It's like we're gonna end this game. We're gonna end this game. Sort of so I gave the speech to my coaches about going for three and two more than going for one. Because I yeah. here's the math why going for two in our game's the most optimal. Because we didn't have a one point kick, which I loved that yeah. rule too. Uh you know, we had the one, two, and three point play. And I'm like, hey guys, you're doing this. And I even said, look. Nowhere in my business model do I have paying double coaches. You have all job security year one. Do crazy stuff. And you know what happens? Yeah. Still one point plays. Still, still, yeah, yeah. still, still the bare minimum, right? And so it's like, it's like no one's getting fired. Like I don't have a bottle that says I can double pay you guys, right? I can only yeah, fire yeah. you for cause. So it was like a, this weird thing, and that's why you have to predict what other people do. But I, I think that going second is is better too. Uh, because you have yeah. the agency to go for two, right? And the assumption yes. is we change this rule because teams are good at scoring in overtime, right? You're, the only reason why we're giving Josh Allen a second chance is because we think he can score two when we saw Mahomes score, right? So we we know it's a touch. You, we, not only do we think we, they can score, but over half the time, both teams can score a touchdown. So now you have the agency. Although there's a 48% conversion rate, you know, again, we're dealing with different. You can't take macro numbers and put it on top of the playoff team numbers because we're assuming yeah. that they're better at offense and they're assuming that they're better at scoring, and so we can't take that exact forty. But now you have the agency to decide the game, just like Oklahoma had or, or Boise State had the uh, the agency to decide the game against Oklahoma. Now you have the agency to decide the game from the two yard line. That's why I think it's better because, like you said, you should never give the sudden death opportunity over to the other team unless you are guaranteed to pin them inside the five on a kickoff. Like, you know, I, I don't really yeah, know. Yeah. Or you have the best onside kicker in the world, and in their kickoff you can surprise onside and get the ball back. Like, I still think it's better to decide the, decide the game at the two-yard line on your terms. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's another thing where Seth Walder, who is a uh, analytics writer with ESPN, he said he reached out to a handful of people. As of yesterday, I don't have his updated poll results when he was asking people in NFL front offices, analytics people. It looks like there were two people said first, three people said second, and a sixth said it would depend upon the defense. And then a seventh now said they lean towards second possession. I mean, maybe I'll make the case for second possession because I think that's the one that makes that makes the most sense for me. So we mentioned again, you if they score a touchdown, the, the concern is it gets to a third possession. So the reasons it would get to a third possession is both teams don't score at all again both teams score a field goal both teams score a touchdown in the in the situation both teams score a touchdown the reason you should always go for two is you, that is a 50 50 opportunity it is essentially 50 so you win the game 50 percent of the time you lose the game 50 percent of the time your alternative is kicking the ball off to the other team in sudden death which is clearly not a 50 50 opportunity so it's it's like that simple i think I think coaches will understand that. I'm, I'm more confident that coaches will do the right thing there than they'll do the right thing with the first touch. And I do think there's some that may go for may go, may go for two there. So you have that, and then you have the informational advantage where if the other team scores a touchdown, you know not to kick a field goal. You know to go for it always on fourth down, even if you're, you're even incentivized not to kick a field goal generally. So that that's the kind of hard part here is 
if you have a middle distance fourth down, do you kick a field goal and give them the possession? I think that's that's a mistake teams are going to make. Whereas you should just very rarely be doing anything except for scoring a touchdown as long as the other team scored something. Now, maybe if you have fourth and 10 and they punted, maybe you need to punt it in that circumstance in, in a certain place. But for me, the enhancement that you get on your touchdown probability by the fact that you know you have to go for it all the time, combined with the fact that you can nullify the third possession by going for two, I think those two things are enough. But again, I'm not, I am not sure. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Seth Burns on Twitter, he brought up the thing. That's, the, the thing that scared me the most was if the other team scores a field goal first. If you go second, the other team scores a field goal. Yes. How nervous are you now to score a field or to kick a field goal, right? Or are you treating it like, I just get an extra down on every set of downs because that's how I would have, uh, approach it is I'm never giving them the sudden death choice, right? They, they, they had the surrender. Now I get a chance to win. And as I look at every fourth down as other, uh, as an opportunity to now I get an extra set of down, extra down for every set of downs versus they only got, you know, they never got to have that extra fourth down. So my play calling changes everything about my, my team's mindset changes. Cause I know I burned the ships. I don't know how coaches are going to do that and approach that midfield field goal where it's like you can kick it and it's still a tur- it's like you just turn the ball over right because it's not a race against the clock you can't not you don't get to go to an end of half situation to get the ball back which is where I think field goals are the most important is when it's not a turnover right where you're not giving the ball back but because there's no a b b a possession s- system like it does in college football it's really scary to kick that field goal when the other first teams kick that field goal that's more pressure than the two point conversion yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's it, there's somewhat of a similar decision as to when you kick a field goal at any time. Like there's this, there's kind of like a valley where, or, or maybe you say a peak for, for for your probability when you should when you should kick a field goal. If you're a certain distance out, you don't want to kick field goals because your field goal probability is lower. So therefore, the benefit that you get from converting is higher because the field goal is not guaranteed. Once you get in this middle area, the field goal becomes almost a guarantee. And you're still far enough away from the end zone where your touchdown probability doesn't rise up enough. So I could see that kind of middle-ish sort of area. You're in the 20-something yard line being an okay. Maybe you would have to kick it in there, but it would have to be like fourth and 12 or something, I feel like, in order to make that decision. Like fourth and 12, you're on the 25-yard line. Maybe you could decide in that sort of circumstance to kick it. But other than that, I agree with you. It just really makes it so you should be playing all the time. But that seems like a huge leak where coaches lots of coaches are not going to do that though lots of coaches on fourth and eight you know with a 45 50 yard field goal are not going to go for it in that circumstance and they're going to kick that field goal and they're going to quote unquote trust their defense in that circumstance yeah and, and i think that you know you should you there's so many things about game strategy that just based on where at the end of the day it's like do you want to have control of the situation right and i think that's where i believe that coaches need to start approaching it a little bit more and it's it's like i'm i'm I kind of sound weird being like, I think you guys need to be tougher guys, right? Be, be, be more, be more proud have somehow have bigger egos because it's like, if you're an offensive coach, you need to, you need to start, you need to convert those fourth downs. I had a coach because our punt, we had our touchback and our out of bounds was also touchback took the ball out to the 35, right? So now on the 40 yard line, fourth and seven, it's really bad to punt. Right. Uh, and yeah. the uh, coach looked at me when, during testing and said, you, you, you'd think I need to go for it here. It's fourth and seven. I go, yeah, but you're an offensive coach. You don't have a play that gets seven yards, right? You know, it's like that kind of mindset where it's, you know, now you have to kind of put put it on yourself. Be like, yeah, I am the play caller. I am that good. I can do it. And, and go convert these things. And now your third down will be easier. But I think it's it, – the strategy is always so hard because the spreadsheet can say one thing, but then you have to actually get people to execute the correct way. And you have to change how you yeah. practice. You change how you practice if you approach fourth down differently, Right. If you if you if you're going to run tempo, you change how you run, how many two minute periods are running. Right. So it, it's it, it everything is connected. Just like when I change rules, it's all systems working together. Now, as you approach your mindset and how you're going to approach different games, if if overtime is going to be longer, how do you practice differently? Do you do less practice time? If the game's going to be closer. How is this? And again, it's only six percent of games are ended overtime. So we talk about this big lofty rule. It was the. It was a rule I spent the, one of the most times on at the XFL, and it never happened in 20 games for us. So you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. There's all, you know, there's even like if you go first, how much more aggressive are you than you would normally be on, on a first drive of the game because you know the other team's going to be more aggressive. There's just so many, so many different things here that's really good. Do you have a case 
for going first other than like your the your your level of confidence that the other coach is going to do the right thing or isn't going to be aggressive enough like how much is, is there just like a the other the other coach is playing optimally and you would still want to go first i'm not quite sure if you could make it out i mean i'd have to really crunch it through but i'm not quite sure well, you know, you, we talk about fringe cases. You brought up like, well, what happens if you get stopped on fourth and inches of the, of the positive end? Uh, do you start yeah. on inches or you start on the yard line? Well, what if the team surprise onside kicks after they go yeah. after they after they score the first touchdown? Yeah, they could do that, right? Because it's you're at that point, you feel like you're at a disadvantage, right? Let's say that no one's playing defense that game, right? And you had a disadvantage. Your defense is dog tired. Why not? Now you've eliminated the the whole intention of the rule. Is that illegal to surprise onside kick? How do you how do you make that illegal? Can you make it so that even a fumble? You know, I, I don't know. Um, that that to me is a, a interesting strategy. I think that if if it's if it's Bills Patriots windy game going first may be better because points are at such a pre uh, a limited that you're guaranteed you you have more like you're more likely to get more series right because you get to end on on series three. Right. And so uh, I think that if a heavy weather game where field goals are going to be what wins the game, not touchdowns, you, going for first is the right way to do it. But I think it's all situational. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And then there, there's one other element as I remember, I think Ben Baldwin was dunking on someone with this, but who was mentioning this. But I do think there is like it's been proven that in a shootout format, the team that goes first has an advantage because of a psychological edge because they are going to be ahead more often, even when you're tied, like ahead on the scoreboard, even when you're tied. So there's more pressure, quote unquote, on the other team. Do you think, I, 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 I'm totally fading this, but <laughs> just try to think of anything here. Like maybe if you go first, you can apply pressure on the other team in a way. I don't know, but that can't over, that cannot overwhelm the informational advantage. But again, it's an additional factor perhaps. Kevin, I worked on my overtime for four years. And I found one article that proved that my overtime was not statistically fair because of momentum, like you're saying. Yeah. Where everything tells me momentum is not real. And never have I said out momentum, loud. Though. It's not momentum, never. though. It's like actual pressure that you're putting on yourself because you're behind. It's like a psychological thing. Maybe it's, maybe it's total bullshit. Which, which, which is what? Momentum's a psychological advantage that you guys are keep rolling and going. That, that, that previous things are going <laughs> to predict the future. Yeah, it's momentum. We're arguing semantics here. But uh, yeah, I've, it's very funny because I've been saying how fair it is and fair it is, fair it is. There is somehow a psychological advantage. In no way in the rule book has it made it, uh, has a shootout made it more advantageous to go one way or the other. The only thing is psychological. And so here's why a shootout's different than soccer and football. And what, yeah. here's what, I never actually had to use this case, but I was always ready. It's one-on-one. -on -one. So you're having one person now has the psychological disadvantage. You now put it on every single play. Now, football's 11 on 11. Well, you could say the amount of pressure is like exponentially higher on that one person, right? There's more surface area of pressure being applied to different places, right? Yes, right. So okay, really, I it's like only that. it's only if the co if the quarterback and the coach quarterback, yes, yes, they're the two people that that if they if they're the ones that feel the pressure, you know, Donovan McNabb at the end of that Super Bowl where he kind of he just got dog tired and and stopped playing as hard as everyone else. You know, Don McNabb catching strays here. Sorry. It? Sorry, big D. Um, uh, you know, that, that, that's the one situation, but now you've separated it out because there's, like you said, there's points of failure of momentum more on the other side of either one. Right now. What's funny is we're talking about these offenses being so great, right? The, the, the goalie in soccer, he can win if, uh, if, uh, the kicker does everything wrong, right? He can dive the wrong way, but the but the uh, but the player who's kicking can go over. Same with the goalie in the shootout, right? And that's the same way offense works. So I always argue offense is harder for than it was because the defense can do nothing right and still have a win on a play versus the offense has to at least do something right, right? They have okay. to miss a tackle and do something. So you know, I think that there's a little bit, but again, it's spread out behind so many more people on in football than in a one-on-one -on -one situation for fan control football league they do their extra points as a one-on-one -on -one, or i guess a two-on-two -two, or two-on-one with a quarterback wide receiver and a defensive back but you know that, and so that's more of a replication but because it's 11 on 11 the shootout's not as big of a deal of having the psychological advantage at least i never saw it i only did so we started every one of our games uh when we were testing with the overtime to guarantee i got one in 
because very important yeah. for rules, timing, or whatever. It was actually so exciting. We thought about starting the game with it and starting it from the start mm -hmm. of, of every game. That's what the store, the score yeah. of the game, because it was so cool. We we're getting exciting, and, and then it's like, no, this is ridiculous and gimmicky. But um, and why should you have more? Yeah, well, the shootout players? is my favorite, though. The shootout is my favorite. But, but now that I think about it, I've, I've actually, you know, this is what happens when you podcast sometimes and you just throw out. Uh, potential problems but now that i think about it, we probably have enough data to like look at teams who have a final drive to tie a game or when they're down from behind which is kind of a similar ish sort of circumstance and i think teams perform pretty well in those circumstances so there probably isn't necessarily like that that same sort of thing because that would yeah, be similar get, right like if you got the ball back at the end of the game down a touchdown yeah no for sure i i it's it's this this is one of the more fun problems to solve because there's so little data to solve some of these problems. Um, uh, and we get to do a lot of conjecture and that's what makes football great. Fans told us to do things why they like football over other sports is innovation and strategy. Every week you see something different and there's going to be a new strategy. Um, and I think that's what makes us fun is now we get to pontificate about this for so long, just for, there's going to be no overtime games next fall. Right. So <laughs> probably yeah. it's probably gonna be no overtime games or the person who makes the wrong decision ends up winning and every, right. everything else that ends up happening. But that's how we get a good, that's how we get a good, good talk, good talk radio cycle out of the NFL every single week. Well, yeah. Sam, thank you so much for joining me. This was great. I knew it would be um, glad to have you on here. Anyone want to follow Sam on Twitter? It's at, Schwartzstein S. Uh, great information there. And again, like I mentioned, kind of hit it earlier, hoping to have you on the podcast quite a bit more. We'll, we'll see what ends up happening here. But this is a great conversation. And uh, anything you want to plug maybe before we get out of here? Yeah. Uh, follow me on Twitter, Schwartzstein S. Um, let's see how many people can actually know how to spell that. Maybe just look it up, put it in the bio of the, of the, of the podcast. Um, and then, yeah, I did a, if you want to learn more about how to do product development, um, in sports in general and kind of create these goals. You can watch my Sloan um, uh, presentation on 42 analytics, YouTube channel, uh, as well as you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. If you guys want to work together on, on some unique things, because um, this is what I do for a living. I innovate in sports. I help other leagues, teams, networks to kind of innovate in unique ways. And so if you want to connect and do some work together, I'd love to help out. Yeah. Yeah. As, as I mentioned earlier, I was watching the reimagining football presentation. Great presentation goes into a lot more detail of some of the things that we discussed today. All right. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. I'll be coming back at you next week with a couple of episodes. We'll start to get into more of the draft stuff, maybe digest a little bit. I'm assuming free agency and trading and all that stuff will be will be done by then and hit on any new research that I'm doing. Uh, until then, I'll be talking at you next week.